Hello, uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Varus Sosue, originated from Togo. Uh, I live in Switzerland and I'm a research and teaching associate professor from Fribourg University. I graduated in PhD philosophy in, at the University of Ottawa. Today I will be giving the course on uh, uh, political science specifically on the corruption and the title of this course is uh, the African underdevelopment and elite corruption generated fact I would like to talk about how uh, beside colonialism and slavery as well based on the African elite corruption the corruption is the main, this corruption is the main cause of Africa's underdevelopment. How Africa has undermined her own process of development, especially since the 70s by corrupted governors, how corruption forms the basis of all violations of human rights in the African and the world's political economical system. I would not like my readers to await a philosophical analysis. Rather, I would like to talk about real facts based on real empirical scientific data, thus leaving pure philosophical speculations and argumentation aside. Corruption, say one of the African thinkers, is a universal phenomenon, but just like other global crimes against humanity, such as the slave trade and colonialism, corruption bothers our conscience so much because it is a business extraordinary without mercy or compassion. I will start with an anecdote. Uh, in a discussion with one of the most internationally recognized experts in strategy, economics, politics, and international relations, as well as African studies in Russia, a man who knows some of the African rulers very well, we have come to touch the problems of Africa's underdevelopment and its probable causes. My reaction of bitterness have prompted in my interlocutor the following question. What then is really wrong with Africa? According to you, Mr. Varososue, where lie the real causes of Africa's underdevelopment. Do you think the problem will be solved one day? How is it to be tackled and solved? My answer to the question, what, what then is really wrong with Africa, was this. Our continent is not poor at all. We are very rich, rich in resources natural, and rich in inventiveness, creativity, and humanly rich. If so, the problem is just one of lack of a sound organization and mismanagement. But we all know the root of this phenomena. The corruption of the elite, then, if so, the so-called lack of organization and mismanagement are mere epi or side phenomena. And only a specific education can solve the problem. Besides that, no other solution is left for us. Then the expert exhorted me to write something on the subject or to seize one of the rare occasions that will be offered me to speak about it. You may guess this is how I come to the choice of this subject of all the reflections there long stuck in my mind. What is true for Africa is obviously true for the whole world. Do you think the problem can be solved? This is the second question and it has got an answer already. Corruption can be eradicated from the face of the world through education a specific one that means also through state and trade organizations, structural, managerial programs, and rules international. But the funniest of all, and of a very striking tone, was my interlocutor's opinion about African tradition. 
According to him, the root of African state corruption is there deeply woven within African traditions as such. For he replied to my answer, saying, but what do you think can be done if it is a cultural problem, a problem embedded within your own tradition? I answer him, if it is a cultural problem, it is far from being rooted in a traditional culture. Rather, it is a modern cultural problem, political and economical. The simple fact that specialists of business and transparency, all regions confounded, bear witness to the empirically attested experience of the Russian culture as one of the cultures where it is difficult to curb, to curb corruption. Besides, there is proofs enough for the universality of the phenomenon. For example, Mr. Fogg of Transparency International, in an interview at Common Ground in the United States, said, the climb to curb corruption is a very long, very difficult one. We've been invited to Russia even by the Russian parliament to help them forge new legislation against corruption. But clearly corruption in Russia is rampant. It is in much of the newly independent states, the successor states of the Soviet Union. It is an enormous problem, we asserted, he asserted, excuse me. Anecdote two. When discussing over the subject sometimes, young Africans, Togolese among them, are used to drawing attention to the fact that it is an international institutionalized practice solemnized by the elites, the rulers, that is by the president and their surroundings. It displays the following dilemma. When called to the ruling scene, the young official either to surround, has to surround his ethical values and obey the commands of his superiors, that is, play the thievery games for his survival or prepares to flee from his own country, if not unluckily enough to die by the strokes of the dictators. Corruption is that the guiding rules of our rulers in Africa. But if it is a modern institutionalized system, it is to be argued that problems originate from somewhere else, from the industrialized countries. This is not to say that African states should be discharged since they are the perpetrators of the system. In our era of a wide recognition of the necessity to reinforce the ideals of human rights, it is surprising that little has been made in the past to link human rights violation with corruption in a more systematic way. Some indicators of national and international corruption. At the dawn of the new millennium, the Gallup Institute has financed and realized an investigation 1999, the first ever known global one, entitled Voices of People. During this investigation, 57,000 adults of 60 countries around the world have been questioned on many world affairs. In the range of questions as to what people condemned the most figured corruption. Endemic corruption is radically condemned. So there is no doubt that no matter the sphere of activity and one's own conception or multinational policy, corruption is a fundamental cultural, economical, social, political plague. If globalization is just like any other social phenomenon, both sources of prosperity are crashed. If a social, political, and economical crash can be caused by mismanagement today and foremost, if a bad governance can have corruption at its wellspring, then 
as demonstrated in many studies and in popular manifestation, corruption also lies, or more accurately put, is a hidden cause of the globalization process. According to the UNDP Human Development Report of the United Nations Development Fund of 1992, for example, 20% of the world's richest population received 82.7% of the global revenue, while 20% of the world's poorest country did have only 1.4%. This gap is widening the pace, having even doubled during the last 30 years since the 70s. According to the 1997 report, for example, from the 45 less developed world countries, 33 are from the sub-Saharan Africa. As shown as shown in Kofi Annan's Millennium Report, we the people, instead of undergoing changes, the situation just stagnates, staying just the same as 20 years behind, if not worse. If Africa is the most neglected country in the process of globalization, then corruption is either the cause of her solitude either by her own bad governance or corrupted system, or by the corrupting strategies and practices of the world's richest country, including the multinationals, World Bank. We will see that both factors are laid down. There are proofs enough showing it, it is both. As the UN Secretary General Kofi Annan Millennium Report sounds, Military dictators in the South withdraw about $27 billion from their state public funds lent to them by international banks in whose own system the funds have been retrieved. Jubilee 2000 stresses the point concerning the process of lending dominated by absolute secrecy. Particular riches and poorest government from the North, England, the United States, France, etc., and the South, Nigeria, Malaysia, etc., cooperate hand in hand in this process with the IMF, the World Bank, etc. It is in the interest of both sets of elites, the creditors and borrowers, to conduct loans in secret, it is said. Ordinary people of these countries are just ignorant of the existence of such loans while they are the ones held to pay back because the elite are sovereign. This is the greatest weakness in the international lending system. The, great, the Green Belt Movement, whose representative is Mr. Wangari Matai, have emphasized corruption in his own in his country as a generalized fact from the leaders level down to the ordinary street people who even baptizes the baptize it chai that means tea or kitu kidogo meaning a small thing this corruption is so baptized tea thievery or corruption is it created with wisdom and good governance? The corrupt people get rewarded with positions and commendations. In this context, it is, stupid, it is a stupid person who allows a good opportunity to enrich oneself with other people's wealth who let it slip away. So, an anti-corruption authority had been created to hoodwink, that means to trick, donors who demanded accountability, transparency, and good governance before they could advance more loans and grants to the government. Along this, along this line of thought, Florini, 
in his somewhat sarcastic article, Does the Invisible Hand Need a Transparency Glove? The Politics of Transparency, a word written in 1999, have emphasized corruption as the root cause, so to say, of such disparate problems as financial volatility, environmental degradation, money laundering, etc. A crucial problem to be solved by transparency. But he remarked, transparency faces much opposition, particularly from those under scrutiny. Such actors have often have strong incentive to avoid providing information. Speakers at the opening session of the Second African Government's Governance Forum, AGF2, have identified corruption as a key obstacle in entrenching transparency and accountability on the continent. In the session opening statement, in Accra, 25th June 1999, 1998, excuse me, Dr. K.Y. Amwako, UN Under Secretary General and Executive Secretary of the Economic Commission for Africa, described corruption as both a governance and a developmental issue, which minimizes the ability of government to reduce poverty and hampers the effective relief delivery of public goods and services. From a recognition of a necessary relativistic approach of the phenomena of corruption as depending on social and cultural factors for its understanding, McLean's A. Jo Jaja and Gat L. Mangum stepped further and stressed its universality, universally normative significance. In most developed countries, elected officials are lowly paid and normally mix their official duties and their private business affair in order to survive. According to them, this duality is an undocumented part of elected government official entitlement contrary to that which exists in developing countries. Using public position for private profit is usually anathema in the latter, but is expected in the former. However, it is a short step from the, that accepted dual loyalty to corrupt practices which sell out the public interest for private profit. In any context in which corruption is perceived, it is both a serious problem in its own right and a symptom of deeper crisis for the world. By and large, fighting corruption in the developing countries has depicted how in most developing countries today, corruption is widespread and part of everyday life. Society has learned to live with it even considering it fatalistically as an integral part of their culture. Not only are public or official decisions, for instance, on the award of government contracts or the amount of tax due bought and sold, but very often access to a public service or the exercise of a right such as obtaining civil documents, also has to be paid for. In practice, the author said it is the environment, for example, in public administration, in which public servants and private act actors operate that causes corruption. On the development, she stressed further, encourage corruption, how is this? First of all, low wages in the civil service encourage petty corruption. And the imbalance between the supply of and demand 
for public services likewise create opportunity for corruption. Also, individuals tend to invest in a career in the public service given the shortage of opportunities in the private sector, thus increasing the likelihood of their involvement in corrupt practices. Another reason is that the low level of education found in underdeveloped countries maintain citizens in a state of ignorance of their rights, barring them from participating in political life. However, she recognized the real impediment to the fight against corruption are as much the interest of the political administrative apparatus as the fatalism and ignorance of the victims. The Africa's crisis of government governance of the director of Africa Business Information Services Tunde Obadina joined the line of critics. He draw attention to the falsity of the common diagnosis thus asserting. Underline many of the structures, reforms and programs put in place to strengthen the rule of law, support democracy and promote greater accountability and transparency in Africa is the notion that poor governance is due largely to incompetence, ignorance, and inadequate infrastructure. So people put the persistence of mismanagement down to a lack of capacity for good governance in Africa. According to him, the African nation's administrative, judicial, and expertise shortcomings cannot explain the abuse and misuse of state power in the continent. For instance, African countries do have a large number of highly trained professionals, he said, including accountants and constitutional lawyers. They are not to be seen as bungling buffons, bunch of idiots, ignorant of art of politics, as often attested even by African people themselves. Nigerian leaders, for example, have not been ineffective and tyrannical because they are incompetent or ignorant. His own diagnosis, the diagnosis of Badina, is the following. Quite simply, Nigerian leaders which means African leaders generally until now, have acted in their own selfish interest in total disregard to existing rules and laid down procedures. Many of the economic policies and action that have entrenched African countries in economic underdevelopment were deliberately carried out to serve the interests of those in power. African ruling elites have benefited enormously from the economic misfortune of their nations. Rather than view African rulers as buffons, we should see them and their actions from the perspective of the interests they serve. African leaders see the state as a source of personal wealth accumulation. There is a high premium on the control of the state, which is the biggest and most easily accessible source of wealth accumulation. The people in power and those who seek power use all means to attain their goal. The phenomenon can just be called scramble for wealth and power, as one of his subtle sound, subtitle sounds. Closer to this vision of corruption as a main cause of political instability is that of Lawrence Cockroft, Cockroft excuse me, the Corporate Response and Chairman of Transparency International, United Kingdom, the author of Corruption as a 
a threat to cooperate behavior and the rule of law. Corruption in business transactions, and especially at the interface between companies and government, has been a fact of life in many countries for a long time. It has frequently been said that companies learn to live with it and by and large economies grows, grow in spite of it. Indonesia, Philippines, Peru, Italy, Nigeria have been his best, best examples. A particular and new factor in this is the clear relation between grand corruption and political instability, which was exposed in the course of the 1990s. Transparency International provides us with more significant information from the voice of his co-founder, Mr. Frank Vogel, author of Boom, Visions and Insights for Creating Wealth in the 21st Century. In his interview, held at Common Ground, a program on world affairs and the people who shape events at the Stanley Foundation with Mrs. Mary Gray Davidson, that was on, on March 26, 1996. The program was uh, number 9613, 9, excuse me. Corruption, according to Mr. Vogel, is doing enormous damage to the effort to secure human rights, democracy, and free, open global commerce around the world. A private businessman who works with government and private companies to fight corruption, Mr. Vogel say it is within the World Bank that world's financial organization for whom he has worked in the past, that he saw the effects of corruption firsthand. We believe, he said, that when governmental actions can take place in secret, then all manner of abuse is possible. Put the sunlit, sunlight on government actions. Make politicians publicly accountable. Make all the transactions of government transparent. And you start to make corruption so much more difficult for a corrupt. Transparency has become used now more and more as a term all over the world to define corruption. He sees in the United States you financial he says in the United States, financial and business system, an example of the best means to fight corruption. For the United States is the only country in the world to have a Foreign Corrupt Practices Act that criminalizes foreign bribery. Thus, American corrupt corporations are subject to the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act which means they cannot pay bribes abroad to win contracts. But whether to establish such an act effectively lead to practices according, accordingly remains for us the question to be raised against him. In Mr. Vogel's opinion, it nevertheless helps, which we agreed upon. Togolese specialists in many fields recently have condemned richest countries' practices in world trade. According to them, richest countries are breaking world trade organization rules. And these have serious consequences for Africa. Africa African countries find it difficult to make others respect the agreement on meat, for example, a basic need, that means food. No one controls those who cheat. Africa represents only 3% only of world trade. What can it do? Asked Jean-Eude 
Amao, economist spe specializing in inter international trade. Expert Amao says that between 1947 to 1986, there was a progressive liberalization of trade, but since 1986, this process has been stopped. In the agricultural sector in particular, there is a constant fight between the USA and Europe. This situation is one of those which generate the African nation debts toward the richest country. Like one of the local economists, Natalie Eklunate, said the Lome Agreement could guarantee ACP countries better prices for their goods. In the 1980s, ACP countries lost US dollar 100 billion when raw material prices fell. In the same period, the total amount of aid to less developed countries was not more than US dollar 50 billion. This indicates not only inequality in the terms of exchanges between poorest and richest countries, rather it is corruption as a state at the state level. It is another turn of neo-colonialism against which the Church, Vatican, thoroughly stand. The problem of international debt and uh, interest is serious, say Archbishop, Archbishop Marcello Sanchez Sorondo, Chancellor of Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences, in an interview with Fides on, the, on July 21st, 2000. Zero 01 last year. To maintain their capital, poor countries pay as much as 15 to, per, to 20, excuse me, they pay as much as, two, as 15 to 20 percent interest simply because they are countries at risk. He emphasizes this means that for an unjustified reason, their debt is higher than that of rich countries. It is evident that, first of all, we must see that a fair interest rate is set at world level. Another question is the double crossing practices practiced by rich countries. They say that the market must be free. But when developing countries attempt to sell their products, mostly farm products, basic necessities, they are not offered fair prices because rich countries subsidize these same products in poor countries. This means poor countries find themselves in a blind alley of instability and hardship because there are no international rules for globalization which is causing phenomena of serious social hardship. Likewise, the Pope himself launched a discussion at a week-long conference of the Plenary Academy of Social Studies taking place at the Vatican, warning that globalization could become a new version of colonialism. The market economy seems to have virtually conquered the entire world. He denounced. The Pope denounced. But if it is a route taken to respond to the emerging market demands respecting liberal initiatives, it has to be controlled by the community, by the social body, and its surrounding regions. One cannot reduce every relation to an economic factor. Franz Fanon, in his book, The Wretched of the Earth, eloquently described the character of the class that inherited power from the colonialists. It is, he said, a sort of little greedy caste, avid and voracious, with the mind of a huckster. 
only too glad to accept the dividend that the former colonial powers hand out, this get-rich-quick middle class shows itself incapable of great ideas or of inventiveness. It remembers that what it has read in European textbooks and imperceptibly it becomes not even the replica of Europe but its caricature. This class, said Fanon prophetically, is not capable of building industries. It is completely canalized into activity of the intermediary type. Its innermost vocation seems to be kept to be to keep in the running and to be part of the racket. The psychology of the national bourgeoisie is that of a businessman, not that of a captain of industry. The description remains accurate for today's elite who have grown through civilian politics, military government, business, and the civil service, says Obadina, the Nigerian. The diagnosis suffers no inadequacy from the situation depicted. The worst part is that much of the fund embezzled by Africans, Africa kleptocrat, are siphoned out to overseas bank. An estimated 20 billion of US dollars, more than what Africa receives in foreign aid, flees to the continent at annually every year. In 1988, for example, France sent 2 million or around 3 million dollars in aid to Africa. But in the same year, according to the independent, nearly independent at the newspaper, nearly CFA, CFA African, West African, French uh, uh, money, three billion five, or four, let's say around uh, four billion percent of the total, 47 percent of the total issue was exchanged in Europe by the Bank of France, some of it exported in suitcases. That was the news from June. 19, 1990, from the independent. One Nigerian banker guesses that Nigerian kleptocrats have at least 25 billion in foreign bank account. A recent World Bank survey reckoned that capital flight during the 1980s may have reached 50 billion, the economy said. Um, the 21st of August, 1993, survey number 10. A Nigerian man and a banker accompanying him were arrested at Lagos airport after trying to board a London-bound jet with 800 million in cash. Custom officials say the seizure was the biggest recorded in Nigeria. The banker accompanied the other man apparently so that custom officials will not ask questions. The money has since been deposited in the Central Bank of Nigeria. The Washington Times says, 19, 29th of July, 1995, A7. While Zarian, among the poorest in the world, were struggling to meet their basic needs, Mobutu, for example, who himself bragged to be among the richest, built mansions and hotels in France, Spain, South Africa, Morocco, Senegal, Togo, Ivory Coast, and stashed billions of dollars in the Swiss bank. His personal fortune was variously estimated to be between 10 to 15 billion more than enough to pay off Zaire's entire foreign debt. In his 32nd years in power, he ran Zaire like his personal fiefdom without any regard whatsoever for the 45 million citizens of the country. The looting of the country's resources by Mobutu 
was known around the world, yet foreign creditors continued to loan money to him. And uh, Dr. Amwako, to the Ghanaian, to sentence a strong and capable state is pivotal to sustaining economic recovery. Mr. Wangari Matai of Kenya depicted the situation with the head of state saying in December 1997, our government constituted an anti-corruption authority. Many people were skeptical and believed that there was no political will to eliminate corruption. This was because the first culprit will have to be the very people who instituted the anti-corruption authority. Now, corrupt leaders are not in the habit of incriminating themselves. Therefore, when the first director of the authority instituted the very first legal proceeding against senior treasury officials for allegedly defrauding the state of millions of dollars, he, rather than they, became the subject of investigation by the state. The very president who appointed him wondered whether he was competent after all. Now, who was fooling who? He lost his job. They kept theirs. The message to the public was that if you are in the right political arena, you have no risk to worry about, even if you are corrupt. We prosecute those who choose to prosecute. With that, the public loses confidence and trust. I will give another example to give corruption a face. He goes on. Early this year, a group of environmentalists and members of parliament tried to stop a privatization of Karura Forest in Nairobi by politically well-connected individuals. What happened? It was a high-level corruption. I was there, he said. We were brutally attacked by a gang which was supported by our police force. When we, when we demanded to know the identity of those who had been allocated the public forest, file disappeared from the registrar's office. The good news is that those allocated the forest are now too ashamed to make themselves known, and therefore the forest might be saved, especially with the new wave of anti-corruption effort in the government. In this case of Karora Forest, a group of citizens and shouting are shouting themselves hoarse, refusing to allow these corrupt individuals to benefit from a public forest. The biggest obstacle is the government. So who will guess, will you guess, the beneficiaries must be? As we already know, high-level corruption is political and requires a national and international political will to eliminate it by making it a risky business. We must break the culture of silence and make corruption a risky business. At one point, our government even suggested that Kenya import a foreign officer to eliminate corruption in Kenya. That was not only an insult to self-respecting citizens, but also an indicator that, were, they were, that there is still no political will to eradicate corruption. Without political will and without checks and balances, to detect, expose, shame, and seek punishment for a corrupt, this culture, especially of the ruling elite, will remain a hard nut to crush. Solutions indicators. Now we talk about the solution. It's enough for the causes, for the meaning of corruption, and for the other parameters of corruption, national and international. Corruption undermines economic fundamentals, legitimacy of governments, democratic values, and the stability of global economy. 
The corrupt act is inherently undemocratic. It involves the exercise of a public duty contrary to the wishes of the electorate which has determined that duty and employs the relevant official to perform it properly. There is no simple correlation between levels of democracy and levels of corruption. Nonetheless, in the long run, democratic regimes arguably generate more powerful antibodies against corruption than, than systems in which political liberties are satisfied. That means we need democracy, control of a government, independence of judiciary, and other factors to safeguard our economic development and to fight against corruption. Though there is no direct link between democracy and uh, uh, well, or economy, or the absence of democracy and corruption. Corruption is, however, particularly harmful in developing countries which tend to have fewer resources. While the globalization of crime via internationally organized criminal syndicates may have a role to play, the causes of corruption are mainly rooted in political and economic conditions and policies of each country. If each country. As such, its causes are as complex as the types of corruption are varied. The spread of neoliberal economics and liberal democratic politics has brought to the fore certain basic assumptions and faces about the causes of the causes and opportunities for corruption. Klitgard notes that three factors are particularly critical in creating opportunities for officials to engage in corruption. First, the monopoly power of officials. The second, the degree of discretion that officials are permitted to exercise. And third, the degree to which institutions are accountable and transparent. Corruption can therefore distort the allocation of resources sharply increasing the cost of goods and services. Divert scarce resources to lesser or non-priorities, in this way largely neglecting fundamental needs, particularly basic needs such as food, health, and education. Act as a distinctive possibility possibly deterring prospective economic activities and investment. Corruption, finally, can increase the likelihood of committing other crimes. Corruption, therefore, becomes both the cause and consequence of underdevelopment and poverty in general. As the Secretary General Kofi Annan said, Corruption is a serious worldwide phenomenon. It has critically hobbled and skewed Africa's development. Addressing the problem of corruption requires targeting both payer and recipient, he said. The problem with Africa is much more difficult because of historical legacies, he points. The Secretary General said, at the Congress of Berlin in 1885, this is one of the causes, the root causes, the colonial powers partitioned Africa into territorial units. Kingdoms, states, and communities in Africa were arbitrarily divided. Unrelated areas and people were just as arbitrarily joined together. The challenge was compounded by the fact that the framework of colonial laws and institutions which some new states inherited had begun has been designed to exploit 
local divisions, not to overcome them. The character of the commercial relations instituted by colonialism also creates long-term distortion in the political economy of Africa. He went on on his brief historical survey. Transportation networks and related physical infrastructure were designed to satisfy the need of trade with the metropolitan country, not to support the balanced growth of an indigenous economy. In addition to frequently imposing unfavorable terms of trade, economic activities that were strongly screwed towards extractive industries are primary commodity to extort, export, excuse me, they are primary commodity for export stimulated little demand for steady and widespread improvement in the skill and educational levels of the workforce. In addition to frequently imposing unfavorable terms of trade, economic activities that were strongly skewed towards extractive industry and primary commodity for export stimulated little demand for steady and widespread improvement in the skills and educational level of the workforce. The difficult relations between state and society in Africa owe much to the authoritarian legacy of colonial governance. Because there was little need to seek political legitimacy, the colonial state did not encourage representation or participation. The result was often social and political fragmentation and sometimes a weak and dependent civil society. A number of African states have continued to rely on centralized and highly personalized forms of government, and some have also fallen into a pattern of corruption, ethnically based decision, and human rights abuses. Notwithstanding, the holding of multi-party election in a majority of African countries, much more must be done to provide an environment in which individuals feel protected, civil society is able to flourish, in which, and government, in which government carries out its responsibilities effectively and transparently with adequate institutional mechanism to ensure accountability. Kofi Annan, therefore, welcomed initiative of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development to reduce the scope of for corruption in ad-funded procurement. He also welcomed the signing of the Convention on Combating Bribery of Foreign Public Officials in international business transactions, which commits signatory to introducing legislation defining bribery and sanctions to punish it. These are important first steps, he said, but much more still needs to be done. African government in particular must get tough on this issue and make the fight against corruption a genuine priority. The costs of not doing so are very high. In lost resources, lost foreign investment, distorted decision making, and falling public confidence, he therefore called Kofi Annan for agreement on a timetable for the early enactment of legis legis legislation in countries implementing the convention and called upon OAU to devise, to devise by the year 2000 a uniform African convention on the conduct of public officials and the transparency of public administration. Now we are in 2002. Whether the work has been done or not, 
we'll see. In summary, we would like to recall a Morocco predicament in the following words. Macro balances or getting the prices right is not economic reform, just as casting a ballot in not, is not democracy. The hallmarks of a capable state are strong institutions of government, governance. That is, institutions based on strong ethical principles and practices. This means governmental institutions should indulge in a sharp focus on the needs of the poor. Powerful watchdogs, the rule of law, intolerance of corruption, transparency and accountability in the management of public affairs, respect for human rights, participation by all citizens in the decisions that affect their lives, as well as the creation of an enabling environment for the private sector and civil society. But it seems that <clears throat> there is no clear-cut procedural orientation to choose as to what of these features of good governance should be given a priority over the others. This is the reason why he radically asserted, if you ask which of these should be the locomotive for growth, I would hard to say all of them. We need to stop thinking of ourselves as a single engine train, but rather a jumbo jet with several engines reviving up for take-off, and several more backups in case of engine failure. So these are the data, scientific, journalistic, political, and uh, a very little reflection of mine, because as I said in the beginning, I didn't want to indulge in uh, philosophical thinking only. Now I have to conclude a few words. How is corruption closely linked with in the underdevelopment in its multifacetous aspects need not to be de need not be demonstrated after this brief survey solely based on media scientific data and international documents, particularly those of the United Nations. Development in all its aspects required money or financial investments, business intercourses, openness to external investors, and respect for the principle of transparency. Development demands that natural resources be duly efficiently managed and exploited. Development avoid spoliation. Development asks the environmental resources be used adequately, adequately, not to be spoiled, endangered, and by so doing jeopardize the lives, security, and well-being of present and future generation, the ecosphere as a whole. Development command the ruling elite to scrupulously observe constitutional predicaments established by themselves in agreement with all members of society, to faithfully govern in conformity with rule of law, principle of good governance, responsibility and accountability. To be in tune with principles of good governance and the aforementioned principle, the institutional conduct of the ruling elite ought to include some process of delegation and devolution of power or authority to civil society and social actors from diverse fields of competence 
so as to make them participate as required by democratic governance. The rule of law calls for the independence of the judiciary to be devotedly observed, an obvious indicator of democratic culture. Development programs call for a steady and sound implementation in fields such as education, basic schools, colleges, professional or technical institutions, in universities, culture, it calls for culture. Society ought to go and to undergo cultural upheaval or improvement as the primary soil of any advancement. Finally, development can hardly be conceived of without respect to fundamentals of religion of religious and or spiritual principles widely agreed upon within society as such, that means which do not endanger people's lives in their body and psyche. Now, we all can easily agree that these are aspects, field scopes of human rights, none of them that stand outside the spectrum of human rights in all its aspects. If this is true, scientific data and international expertise laid down in this paper touching corruption, which are internationally known as features of common practices of African elites, and none of the rest of the world as well, and some of the, world, of the rest of the world as well, excuse me, will lead us to the following conclusion. That means if all the things reported here, the data reported here, are true, then they will lead us to the following conclusion. African elite, elites, sometimes aided by Western multinationals and rulers, have severely undermined, severely undermined the developmental process of the continent jeopardize the lives of the present and the coming generation by their misuse and spoliation of the resources of the continent. For it is not at all possible to be in accordance with the principle of human rights while failing to pay a due and faithful, faithful allegiance rules to rules of transparency in public funds management to rule of law, generally speaking, to principles of good governance. Corruption, as usually indulged in by African elites, have undermined the African progress. The UN Secretary General Kofi Annan urgently warned against the institutionalized corruption in public goods management and economic saying, those African leaders who are guilty of these misdeeds and the international financial institutions who support them stocking the funds abroad in foreign banks where they cannot be retrieved to their owners should be held responsible and summoned to account for their crimes. Finally, say, history will judge them. Well, thank you very much.